and welcome everyone to what I'm told is the 20th online broadcast that Bookmarks have done this year. And happy International Women's Day. Um, as many of you will know, uh, International Women's Day was first organised by Socialist Women to commemorate a huge march of women garment workers in New York. It's been a day when we celebrate the achievements of women throughout history and a day when we try and continue their struggles. Um, International Women's Day in 1917 was also the day when women workers in Russia came out on strike uh, in the events that marked the beginning of what became the 1917 Russian Revolution. So today we are going to talk about the life and times of someone from that era, the Bolshevik journalist Larissa Reisner. And we're launching a new book of some of her writings called The Hammer and the Anvil. Uh, we have two speakers today. Uh, Judy Cox is the author of the Women's Revolution, Russia 1905 to 1917, and a new book, The Rebellious Daughters of History, uh, about revolutionary women throughout history. And she also wrote an introduction to, to this book that we're talking about today. And Jack Robertson, uh, the translator of Reisner's writings, and also the author of The Man Who Shook His Fist at the Tsar. And Jack is also going to be showing some videos a bit later as well. Um, so we have, after the speaker speak, we have some time for questions to both of them. So if you have questions um, or comments, do put them in the chat um, if, you're, if you're watching this online. So um, firstly, I will um, I'll hand over to Judy to, to kick us off. Thank you so much, Camilla, and thank you, Bookmarks, for hosting this event this evening. It is, of course, entirely fitting that we spend the uh, evening of International Women's Day talking about Larissa Reisner. Firstly, because, as Camilla says, the um, starting point, really, of the February Revolution in Russia was an, out, uh, an uprising of women who to mark International Women's Day, and that uprising played a, a hugely important role in sparking the revolution and in um, transforming, really, possibilities for women and the whole working class inside Russia and played a huge part in the life of Larissa Reisner. It's also incredibly apt because Larissa Reisner herself really embodies a spirit of militancy, of defiance, of huge new possibilities opening up through um, the project of socialist revolution. Larissa Reisner in many ways embodied a dynamic and creative spirit of Russia's revolutionary years. She was a poet, she was a journalist, she was a revolutionary and she was a soldier. A, an incredible um, life that she led in only a few years. She took part in not one but two great revolutionary moments. So she was present and active, a participant in events in Russia in 1917 and 18 and onwards. She also was a witness to the great German revolution of 1923. Most of us settle for one revolutionary moment. Larissa Reisner was there for two. So who was this incredible woman? She was born in May 18. 1995 in Lublin, in Lublin, sorry, in Russian occupied Poland. And she was born into a family, quite professional family. Um, I think her dad was a lawyer and uh, a lecturer at university. And it was really that held increasingly militant and progressive views, like many people suffering under the tyranny of the Tsar, they increasingly looked to socialist organisations in order to try and improve their lives. Because of this, in 1903, Larissa and her whole family were forced to move uh, to Berlin to escape the repression of the Tsar, they were worried about being put in prison. In Germany, and I think there's really interesting links between Russia and Germany, in Germany Larissa remembered meeting some of the great figures of the German socialist movement. I wish she, I could find evidence that she met Rosa Luxemburg, but no, but there is evidence that she met August Babel, who wrote a great socialist book about women, and Karl Liebknecht, who was Rosa Luxemburg's great comrade, Great, uh, who stood with Rosa Luxemburg against the First World War and shared um, her murder, was, was murdered on the same day as her. So there's Larissa and her family in exile. But in 1905, an incredible event happened. In 1905, peaceful marchers protesting over um, poverty and ill health and bad diet in Russia, marching through the Russian capital of St. Petersburg, were fired on by troops. And this sent shockwaves 
throughout Russia and throughout the Russian Empire, and it led to a revolution. So it was known as Bloody Sunday, and such was the outcry that mass strike movements, insurrectionary movements, and a huge strike, uh, a revolutionary wave uh, swept across Russia and the empire. After the revolution, Larissa and her family were able to move back to St. Petersburg, where she graduated from um, the University of St. Petersburg, when it was quite unusual then to be a woman to go into higher education. Especially Russia, she had to fight very hard to be accepted, and she began to establish a reputation as a poet and a writer amongst St. Petersburg's writing bohemian and radical circles. The, the next great event in her life was um, the outbreak of war in August 1914. Very significant because many of the poets that she kind of hung around with and socialized with and wrote with fell into supporting their own government's war effort. And this was mirrored really in the whole international socialist movement where many great socialist figures who waved red flag and pronounced that they would die rather than go to war against their fellow workers faced with the prospect of war, collapsed in behind supporting their own governments and their own war efforts. Larissa Reisner did not fall in behind her government. She stood out against the horrors of the First World War. And her family not only opposed the war, they tried to organize against it, which was incredibly dangerous and incredibly brave thing to do in 1914, 1915, 1916 in Russia. And they founded a, an anti-war publication, which they paid for with their own money, and it collapsed when they ran out of funds. But by the end of the war, or certainly by the end of 1916, the beginning of 1917, Larissa and her friends could sense a mood. Um, there's writings that where she was up, going up and down the river Volga with some friends and she said this, this string that holds the Russians to their government is stretching tighter and tighter. The casualties, the miseries of the war, the poverty that was um, building up. And then suddenly in February 1917, that string snaps and the revolution sparked by the women on International Women's Day bursts forward. Um, tens of millions of people are on the move, becoming political. The Tsar, who has ruled not only Russia, but the whole empire with his iron grip. His family have been, you know, the despots of Russia for three, four hundred years. And suddenly overnight, in February 1917, he's forced to abdicate, he's put in prison, everything changes and everything seems possible. Tens of thousands of workers and soldiers are beginning to create a movement which is based not on a different sort of government, a different flavour of government, but on workers' power and on um, workers' and soldiers' councils. In February 1917, Larissa Reisner becomes involved with Maxine Gorky's radical paper. She also began teaching workers in the Provisional Government Spelling Reform Programme. And this was not some kind of do-goody philanthropy. The whole question of literacy was very central to the revolution. It was very central that workers should be able to read, that workers should be able to participate in politics. There's huge hurdles to try and overcome illiteracy and the, and, and the legacy of czarist repression meant that a, a very high importance was put on education and on literacy. So she... Um, gets involved in teaching workers in the Sailors Club of, Club of Kronstadt. She met a, a Bolshevik called Fyodor, Fyodor Raskolnikov, who she later um, married. In October 1917, immediately after the October Revolution, Larissa Rice, this young, brave woman, turns up at the Bolshevik Central Committee and says that she would like to offer her services to the revolution. She says... I can ride, I can shoot, I can reconnoitre, I can write, I can send correspondence from the front, and if necessary, I will die for the revolution. So she went and presented herself as somebody who could fight like a, like a man, could fight in a military way as well as with her words um, 
and with her expertise. She went to work with a leading Bolshevik called Anatoly Lunachowski, and she issued an appeal to Petrograd's artists to show support to the new regime. And she was successful in pulling um, very important poets and theatre designers and so on behind the Bolshevik party, the Bolshevik um, party and behind the new government. She also uh, catalogued works of art requisitioned from the um, homes of the wealthy and began to catalog them so they could be put on display for the workers to enjoy mm -hmm. by the work of the government. What a great job. Wouldn't you love that job to take works of art from the homes of the wealthy and present them for, uh, for workers to enjoy in a completely different way. It was in 1918 that Larissa joined the Bolshevik party. Um, this embryonic worker state was considered so threatening that coalition imperial powers um, began to attack Russia and began to try and militarily defeat the revolution. I know Jack's going to talk much more about this, but um, there was a rebellion of Czech soldiers along the River Volga. German troops were invading and um, threatening Moscow from the west. The uh, anti-socialist white Russian armies were approaching Moscow from the east. So Moscow was caught in this kind of pincer movement of all these foreign and um, anti-Bolshevik armies. It was a desperate need to defend the revolution that led Larissa and thousands of other young, idealistic, young socialists to volunteer for the Red Army. Larissa Reiser became a political commissar in the army. And in the summer of 1918, um, when the city of Kazan fell to the whites, she was met one of many who flocked to the area to stem the white tide. Um, and in a series of epic battles, thousands of activists like Larissa played a crucial role in agitating amongst the war-weary regular troops to encourage them and to motivate them to continue fighting. And the way she put it was to say that they put the bone into the soft body of the army. So I'm going to speed on quickly. In 1919, Larissa was the commissar um, in the naval headquarters and she fought and took part in battles along the Volga. Um, on her return to uh, then named St. Petrograd in 1920, she wrote her hugely popular book, Letters from the Front, where she distilled all this experience of how to fight a revolutionary war that, that defeated the white armies. She was posted to Afghanistan in 1921, uh, her job there was to win Afghanistan over to the Russian cause. And in 1923, she traveled illegally to Germany, where she witnessed the uh, German Revolution of 1923 and published three important collections of articles about the German Revolution. Back in Russia, she continued to work, traveling very widely, exploring the lives and political ideas of working class people, describing what life was like and developing herself as a revolutionary. Her writing were wide read and celebrated throughout Soviet Russia in 1920s. We will never know what, Rush, what Larissa Reisner might have accomplished because she died of typhus in 1926, aged just 30. So she did all this before she was 30. Neither do we know she would have responded to the rise of Stalin, but we do know she worked very closely with Leon Trotsky in the Red Army and praised his fantastic role in galvanizing the army and rescuing the revolution from the white armies. Her lover, Karl Ravadik, said this about her. The one theme is the October Revolution. As long as people fight and think and feel, and as long as they were drawn to find out what it was like, they will read her books and will not put them down until they have reached the last page, for they smell the revolution in their breath. And that's what Jack's done by translating these books. He's given us the smell of revolution, the smell of how women could act in a completely new way to build a completely new society. Thank you, Judy. Um, thank you for that brilliant introduction to Larissa Reisner's life. Um, it's great to see so many people watching online and I can see people commenting about how amazing they think um, she was and someone commented that they never heard of her before so that's um, great that we're um, uh, raising um, 
awareness of some of these people that we don't always hear about in the in the history books. Uh, so I'm going to pass over next to Jack, who is the translator of Reisner's writings and put together this this new collection. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll start by I will actually start by thanking a few people. Um, First of all, Judy, who's just given that fantastic introduction, and Camilla for sacrificing part of the Monday night to come along and do this. But I really mainly wanted to thank some of the people who, the, the, the production of this book kind of took place over a very strange period of time, like we've all been through. Um, so it's mostly been done by a remote, but we managed to kind of bring together um, a little team, some of whom have never met each other at all yet. I think Roger, who's the mastermind of Red Words books, I, I think I probably met him twice in a year. Most of the rest of the time, it was all by text and phone. Um, the, he's the person who not only brings together the books, but he also did, designed, does all the artwork, does inside a typography and all that kind of thing and I think he's done a fantastic job on this book here um, the other people unseen behind that are that have contributed are uh, Carol uh, Williams who did all the um, proofreading on this book and uh, also a fantastic job and particularly want to thank a couple of people from Queen Mary College which is where I learnt Russian myself quite a long time ago um, and they, they are Jeremy Hicks, who's now the professor of the Modern Languages Department and head of Russian department, who's helped quite a bit on all of this. And also, I, I asked at one stage for volu a volunteer who would read through the translation that I had done. And the person who got <laughs> lumbered with that was a, a third year student called George Bolton, who went through everything I'd done. Uh, in the period just before Christmas when he, you know, everybody was up to eyes and in college trying to get things sorted out. He was trying to sort his own visit to Russia this year and all that kind of thing. So he did really went out of his way to help with that. So that's the thank yous. The, I'm not going to speak terribly long about this book. I'm going to try and just put it into a little bit of context on the immediate history and the geography of the area that we're talking about. Because the book, the the, the, the translations I've done from Larissa Reisner's writings, all they, they form part of what was called the front, which is, Judy's already mentioned. But they took the, the, the chapters or the articles I've, I've translated cover a very short period really between August 1918, which is coming towards the end of the first year of the revolution and into the summer of 1919. And like Judy said, this is really a pivotal period in the history of the revolution. It was actually hanging by a thread at the time. And Trotsky describes this very well in a, a chapter of his autobiography, uh, My Life, which is called A Month at Sviashk which is the name of a place. I'll try and explain that to you a bit later. But he went he, he went there and uh, Larissa Reisner was there at the same time. And this is Trotsky's description of what things were like at that point. He said, the spring and summer of 1918 were unusually hard. All the aftermath of the war was then just beginning to make itself felt. At times, it seemed as if everything was slipping and crumbling. One wondered if a country so despairing, so economically exhausted, so devastated, had enough sap left in it to support a new regime and preserve its independence. There was no food, there was no army, conspiracies were being hatched everywhere. So that's the situation in, excuse me, August 9, uh, 1918. He goes on to describe the territory that I'm going to try and get my slides up now to assist me with this. Um, uh, 
There we go. Yeah. Now, you know, this is not as big as I would like it to be, but hopefully you'll stay with me. This is a, a map from one page of a, the, the Dent Atlas of Russian history, which if you're, if you're interested in Russia and its history is a very good thing to have. Um, if you look in the middle of this, so there's, follow the cursor, there's St. Petersburg, or by now Petrograd over here. Kazan, which you'll hear a lot about, is here. And Moscow is in, in between there. Before um, the summer of 1918, the Bolsheviks had control of territory, which is marked by this bold line to the east and this one to the, the west. And you can see from that that by then they're completely surrounded. You've got up here, you've got the British, the Americans, the Italians uh, attacking. You've got on the uh, western boundary here the virtually the anti-bolshevik forces have virtually reached petrograd and over here the whites have actually taken kazan from the bolsheviks now the importance of kazan i'll bring down to the next one now is that it, it was a strategic point on the river volga the volga's you know to us, well, it's maybe to do with boat songs or whatever, but it was the biggest, it is the biggest river in Europe. And uh, I've had various discussions with people about how wide it is, but I think the consensus is that some places it's about 19 miles wide, so it's massive. And in Kazan, there was a, a, a port which the, the, the white anti-Bolshevik navy had taken control of. They also at that by then had actually taken control of the Bolshevik gold reserves, which were held in Kazan. Um, and when they entered the city, they'd, they'd massacred anybody that was likely to be a, Bos a Bolshevik and or a Jew. I mean, that's just what they did. It, this map here that you see um, is a modern map. This, this is just from a, a, a Google screenshot. Um, but I, I've put it up because... It, it's important in trying to explain what Sviashk is. And actually, there's a whole section in Larissa Reisner's reports where she explains the importance of Sviashk. It was a place no, not even Russians had heard of up until this point. But what happens is that the Bolsheviks were forced to retreat. I don't think they went on this road that Google shows you, but somehow they got to Sviashk, which is here. And, and it's actually an island which is joined onto the western bank of the Volga by a causeway. So they retreated to there and they mounted a kind of Alamo type operation where, you know, they fought off everything that was thrown at them. But not only that, the, the white forces were so, became so convinced that there must be a massive Bolshevik force there that they retreated. And they never stopped retreating from that point onwards. They were driven out of the entire area. And what happens in the book is that it then goes, Larissa Reisner describes all this on land, the land battles. But then she goes on to describe the sea battles that then took place up and down the Volga until they'd driven the White Navy out of the Volga entirely into the Caspian Sea and Caspian Sea down to the south. And then uh, out of the area entirely. Now I've put uh, again. This will you'll this will make sense maybe better later on. We one of the things I discovered talking to Jeremy Hicks about all of this just before Christmas was, he said to me, um, "Did you know that um, there was a film made of all this?" <laughs> Which I didn't. It was com complete. Uh, well, I'd, I'd heard of the film, but I didn't know that. It, that it covered so much of these events. And that film is Anniversary of the Revolution by Ziga Vertov, uh, who was an avant-garde uh, cine cinematographer at the same time as people like Eisenstein. He, his most famous film is Chilevac, Chilevac Saparatum, which means Man with a Movie Camera. 
um, which you can get, you know, on Tartan Video or something like that. It's a fantastic film. But Anniversary of, of the Revolution wasn't really seen much in the West until a couple of years ago on the anniversary of its first being released. Uh, a Russian cine archivist called Nikolai Izvalov uh, reproduced it, uh, renovated it, and put it back on, on general release. Uh, and th this still here is describing, uh, in the film it's an animation, and it appears in the last 30 minutes of the entire, mo the entire movie, Anniversary of the Revolution, actually lasts two hours. But the last 30 minutes is called the Czechoslovak Front, and it covers exactly the... Uh, events that Larissa Reisner describes in her book and at the beginning of it there is this there's an animation which shows the noose that was around Kazan being driven back by these arrows here until it's it's removed altogether. Now these writings this is well it's not actually all that complicated at all but in Russia various versions of her works have been brought out at various times. The translation that I've done is based on a collection of two volumes that first came out in 1928 uh, in Russia. She was still alive at the time, so she was obviously involved in the, in the production. And the second volume of that um, Quite a lot of it was translated in 1977 by a bloke called Richard Chappell. It was published by Pluto Press and it appeared um, in the book that Judy's mentioned already called Hamburg at the Barricades, excuse me. So this is volume one, which is what I work from in which the main two parts of it really are the front and the second bit is Afghanistan, which is a series of articles about Afghanistan when she went there. So that says Sobrani Sochinenya, which is collected works, Tom Adin, volume one, and that's her name up there in Russian, Larissa Reisner. At the very beginning of this, she really dedicates the book to these people here, which is the workers inside what's called the Rabfac or the Rabochi Facultet, the Workers Academy, really, um, in which she describes them. Uh, that's where they went to have be learn and imbibe Marx, Lenin, and Trotsky, and not only learn about all these things, but also be able to pass their knowledge on to. The, the, the coming generations. So she's dedicated the, the, the introduction to them. She also mentions in the introduction a poem by Vladimir Mayakovsky, who people will have heard of, um, but they might not know about where this comes from. And so this is from a, a, a collection of his poems, which was produced in conjunction with the artist El Lizitsky, it was first published in Berlin in 1923. So she obviously knew about this by 1928. She wouldn't have known about it in 1918. Um, and what it shows is there on the left, it says, Lavoy, 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 which is the name of the poem, left, left, left. There's a Communist Party flag. And then over here is left march, Levy march, left march. And that word there is important. It's matrosam, which is to the sailors. So he, he's really praising the role of the sailors in the revolution, which everybody was aware of. You know, people obviously know about the, you know, the gun firing from Aurora and all that. But um, the, the sailors did play a fantastically important role in all of this. And they play a fantastically important role in the book because uh, Larissa Reisner actually goes on to these destroyers um, with the sailors to fight against the whites with her husband, who was, um, Judy's mentioned already, his name was Raskolnikov. Well, that was a pseudonym, which you, you, some of you might know from Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment. He picked that pseudonym 
um, for himself. His real name was Ilian. Um, but he, beca- he, he was a midshipman in the Baltic fleet. He was arrested, actually, by, by the British when, when they were fighting uh, the, the Bolshevik fleet in the Baltic. Uh, his ship ran aground. They arrested him. They took him to Brixton Prison in South London, where he was for about five months, I think. And then he was a, there was a prisoner exchange. He was exchanged for about 19 prisoners. So it shows you the value they put upon him. Um, he then went back almost immediately to the Volga to join this fight back against the whites. And he became, well, the, the Larissa Reisner and him married in the summer of 1918. During the fighting that she describes, he was the admiral of the fleet, effectively, on the Volga. Um, so that poem there, the reason I've mentioned it is that she mentions it, but also when you buy the book and start to read it, you'll be thinking, why on earth has this suddenly appeared? And the re- that's the reason for it. And I've done my own trans- translation, so it's up to you to, you know, you'll have to decide whether that's any good or not. Um, so I'm going to now rattle through some of these other um images and most of these actually have been nicked from you know the there's a a, 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 a a fellow who archived masses amount of posters and photograph photographs from the Russian Revolution I called David King who only died a couple of years ago I kind of vaguely knew about him in the 70s when we knew him really better because he was the person who designed all the amazing artwork for the Anti-Nazi League. Um, all the posters, Never Again, and all that stuff was done by Dave King. But at the same time, almost, he was putting together these compilations of, there's more than one of them. The one I've used is Red Star Over Russia. And this shows Trotsky at the front in 1919, exactly the time, talking to officers and men there. Um, this is a a picture from his book is also, which is one of the Bolshevik units. And just very vaguely at the bottom there, you can see somebody's written Maya Banda, which is my gang. So this is what one of the Bolshevik um, battalions would have looked like in that. This is actually in Orenburg, but that is roughly in the same kind of area and at the same time. At the other end of the country, in Petersburg, this, this, a similar defence was taking place um, of the capital and, well, sorry, not the capital, of, of Petrograd, and women were being recruited as volunteers, so this is one of those groups there. Um, this next photograph I'm going to show you now, put it up on bigger. This um, uh, was, a, I, I was very pleased to find this because in the... Uh, description of the river battles, Larissa Reisner mentions a, a boat called Pritki or Nimble. And what I discovered was that this image you're saying, seeing here is the same boat built in the Yarrow shipyards in Glasgow. Uh, and so that it was bought for the Tsarist Imperial Navy, um, taken to the Baltic fleet. When the Bolsheviks requisitioned it after the revolution, they changed the name. This is Sokol here, which means falcon. And they changed it to Priki, which means nimble. And that gets a, a number of different mentions in the story that uh, Larissa Reisner describes. Um, if we go back now, oh, these things, honestly. Um, the next one, oh, I've gone too far now. Um, this, this is also from Dave King, and this is an image which shows it's a prison barge which ha- held about 600 prisoners, uh, people, not or ordinary citizens taken prisoner by the whites and put onto this barge and then set adrift really onto the Volga. It was There's a whole description in the book of the rescue of this by the fleet or the flotilla that Larissa Reisner was part of. Um, And if you look right in the corner there, there's 
a little tugboat, which is kind of like, you know, these Mississippi river boats with the paddles on the side. It, it was a tug. But what they did was put cannon on the front and the back, and it took part in the battles. And there's a very famous scene in the book where the commander of that, a man called uh, Markin, uh, does a, a, a really heroic um, fight back against the whites who, who uh, got a, a, an emplacement on the bank, and he dies during the uh, this engagement. Um, the next picture is of... Now, I'm going to hopefully, at the end of this... Uh, We've got a couple of clips from the um, Ziga Vertov film, which I hope we will show right at the end of this. One is Trotsky arriving on his train to this uh, to Sviazhk. Um The other one is film on taken on the Volga um, at the same time as all this is going on. And this image here, which again from Dave King, this is a little bit later, but still in 1919. And by this time, the train has become really emblematic of the revolution. I mean, I'm sure you'll all have seen pictures of it before, but I'll read the the caption that's on Dave King's version of it. This is a the October Revolution agitational propaganda train arriving at Soratinskaya Station near Samara in 1919. The carriages were decorated with themes of revolution and the struggle against capitalism. You know, there's bosses with bayonets up the backside and all that stuff. On board, the local population could visit the cinema, bookstores, radio station and print shop. There was even a complaints department, it says. And you can see, you know, the the excitement that this created when the train, every time it, let, it arrived anywhere, um, the, there was a huge crowd uh, uh, assembled in order to uh, greet the train. Now, right, so, I'll, well, I'm going to, that's really the finish of my talk. I'm going to very briefly rattle through, if you get hooked on Larissa Reisner and or this period we're talking about, there's plenty of stuff you can read about it that, you know, is mostly written out of the mainstream histories of this period. I think, you know, I, I think I have knew a fair lot about Russian history. I didn't know anything about this, these events at all before I started translating for the book. Um, but you can read, you know, other stuff, which, like, for example, here's the Hamburg at the Barricades, uh, the Richard Chappell book. Then there's a very famous biography. Ooh, where's it gone? of um, Kathy P uh, Larissa Reisner, published by Virago, uh, by Kathy Porter, which I think is where most people get their, uh, you know, their, their knowledge of Larissa's life from. Go back here a bit. Uh, we've got the autobiography I mentioned of Trotsky, where there's, chap there's actually two chapters that we reproduce in the book. There's one called... The, the, a month in Sviashk, and the other one is about the train and how it was utilised uh, from then. Really, the, 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 the journey to Sviashk is the first time it was used, but then it becomes like a uh, central to the way that they fought uh, the, the, the white forces back. Uh, and finally, there's this one, which is um, Year one of the revolution, of the Russian Revolution, which is by Vic, Vic, Victor Serge. Uh, that was translated first time in 1972, I think, uh, in America, but then in England by Pluto Press and Bookmarks. Uh, it was translated by Peter Sedgwick, and the introduction in it is by Paul Foote. This is uh, Judy's book, The Women's Revolution in Russia, 1905-1917. And then there's the, the Red Star over Russia, which I've talked about, which is Dave King's book, um, which is well worth reading. Um, so now I'm going to hand you back to Dave, and hopefully he'll be able to show you these short video clips, if you can just bear with me.
Dave? Okay. 
<laughs> brilliant videos. I don't think I've ever seen a video like that of Bolsheviks dancing. I think it really no. gives um, a sense of what it was <laughs> like to kind of actually live in these these world historic times. Um, so we're just waiting for people to put their questions in the chat. But while you kind of think of some things you want to ask, I've got one question to start off with. It's a question from Jan and she says it's wonderful to hear about the heroism of the Bolshevik army. Can the speakers elaborate more about the role of women in it? So uh, maybe uh, Judy, did you want to go first? <laughs> Shall I go first and give Jack yes, a break? I think you uh, should, Jack's Judy. promised that every copy of the book that's sold, he's going to do a dance like that. So <laughs> please rock your orders in because he's going to do a, a proper Bolshevik dance for us. Um, the, the number of women in the Bolshevik army was relatively small compared to the number of men because something like between 50 and 70,000 women volunteered for the army by about 1920, which sounds quite a lot. But when you think about how massive the army was, it was, uh, it was less than 5% were actually women. Um, but they were volunteers, not conscripts. So they were politically motivated women who were defying incredible um, odds to become women soldiers. And some did, like Larissa, become political commissars. Eugenie Bosch was a Jewish activist who led an army troop and um, put down several mutinies and became briefly, I think, the prime minister of the Soviet Ukraine, if they had prime minister, president, whatever. So she's sometimes um, spoken of as the first um, woman leader of a European nation. but um, So th there were small numbers, but the ones who did were very heroic, because you can imagine even in uh, Russia, attitudes in large parts of the country were not that progressive. But the women who did were hard, incredibly motivated, and, and defied all the odds to fight and sacrifice their lives for the revolution. A lot more women also served as nurses and so on. And if they fell into the hands of the white armies, they could expect the most appalling treatment, as you can imagine. So they were incredibly um, inspirational figures, really. And, and it's quite right we think about them on, on this day, on International Women's Day, because women you know, took up arms and defied all notions of a woman's role in society to fight for a better future. Jack, did you have any comments on that? No, I'm just, I'm looking at another question here, but um, I think there's two small things. One, well, one's just a silly little thing, really, but if you go, I th I, I, Dave told me that these clips will be recorded and that you can go back and look at this stuff afterwards on the second clip there on the volga with the the dancing sailors um right at the end of that you'll see that there's one woman on the right of the screen um and i've got a suspicion that that might be larissa reisner i've got no proof of that but it'd be very i can't think who else it would be that was there um I don't know a lot about the, you know, how many women were involved in the in, in the in the army and all the rest of it. What I do know is that, and she describes it at quite a great length in the book. It's one of the great things about her reports is that when she was having to flee the whites, she was protected all over the place by peasant women mm -hmm. uh, who came to her aid and. Uh, helped you know and, and clearly supported the, the revolution and the other thing about it is that that picture that i put up from uh, dave king of the, the 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 volunteer brigade in petrograd these articles that um larissa reisner wrote well they were sent as dispatches to what was then the Pet petrograd soviet bulletin called izvestia I mean, everybody probably heard of Izvestia nowadays as a big time newspaper, but at the time it was the only news people got. And so women like those women who were armed to the teeth there, as you could see in the volunteer defense brigade, they would have been reading and we, we know that they did read what Larissa wrote avidly. Uh, you know, they, they were distributed in their tens of thousands, these articles, people lapped them up. 
And so, uh, you know, I think it is important that that, that she she her name is restored. Uh, you know, I and and also the brilliance of her, her writing. I, I forgot to uh, maybe I'll get a chance a bit later on, but I did want to read out a bit, just a passage from. Uh, one of her translations. I'd like to do that, but it doesn't fit in re replying to this, really. Great. Um, got another question in. Um, great introductions from Jack and Judy. Was Larissa involved in the left opposition, given her close collaboration with Trotsky in the Civil War? <laughs> um, no, I don't think she was, because she died in um, 1926. Uh, but her husband, Raskolnikov, um he he tried to make an accommodation with Stalin uh, in the late twenties, but it didn't work out and he ended up feeling betrayed by the Stalinists and he ended up writing a, a letter condemning Stalin, which he was hauled up for. And the next thing was that he it was reported that he'd by some mysterious happening he'd fallen out of a window and died so there's a bit of Dario of four to the end of his life there um, he, there are other people who at the end of the book you'll find that there's some midi, mini biographies of some of the other people who fought in the mainly in the, the naval battles um, who were close associates. So there's a guy called Ivan Smirnov, who was a very close associate of Trotsky. He became a member of the left opposition. There's a picture of him with the left opposition, with Trotsky and Ivan Smirnov sitting right next to him. Um, he was also uh, a victim of Stalin. Um, there, there, there are number, nearly everybody who appears in this as a hero to Larissa Reisner is dead by the middle of the 1930s. They've been wiped out uh, completely um, from history. And most of them were never heard of again, actually, until, you know, in the 60s and 70s, they started to get rehabilitated and stuff like that. But for a long, long time, the, 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 you weren't even allowed to mention the, the names of these people. Okay. Um, thanks. <laughs> Did you have anything to add, Judy, about? Um, only that she wrote very powerfully about Trotsky's central role when he arrived on the train and, and his role in galvanising the Red Armies and, and really saving the Russian Revolution in that sense. And he also wrote very powerfully um, when she died. And he said what a tragedy it was that this flaming spirit of revolution was extinguished not on the battlefield but in a hospital ward she didn't die you know fighting with the army she died of an illness which of course Inessa Armand also died of cholera at the age of 46 so many people were wiped out by the poverty by the um famines um instigated by the by the white armies and the blockades even before Stalin as Jack said did his uh, dirty work too yeah, I can see a couple more questions coming in. Um, so maybe we'll we'll just do them in the last few minutes. But um, Colm kind of asks about Larissa Reisner's legacy and was her writing buried or ignored as a result of her association with Trotsky and the tribute she paid paid to his role in the Civil War, which I guess is really interesting about you know the. Um, commemoration or lack of commemoration of these some of these thinkers in Russia even today and um, Dean Compton asks where does Poland sit within the counter-revolution I don't know if you have any thoughts on on Poland um, Jack seems to have disappeared on us briefly yeah, yeah. Oh, there he's back yeah so I was written out of history there I don't know what happened. Um, Shall I just have a stab while Jack? There, there um, people were asking about whether her writings were popular, and and about Poland's role in the counter-revolution. Okay. So I'll um, stab, and then Jack can 
gather his thoughts if that's okay. Um, I know she had an enormous literary reputation in She's oh, that's a shame. Uh, Judy's a bit there, Judy. Judy. I'm going to you, Camilla. Do you let? Would you let me read a passage from her now, while Judy's unfrozen? Yeah, go for it. Um, so I'm going. This I should have read you this before. This is. I'm just. This is just to get across the style of her writing, which is. It's not like the normal stuff you would expect. It's very. Um, I cinematic i think in a way and and it gives you an immediacy about the struggle which you don't often get obviously because she was there but she was also a great writer and so this is a description of when they're going up the river kama which is a tri tributary of the volga and this is what she said i'm just going to read a short section of it she says at the first rays of dawn the beauty of these shores is extraordinary. The Kama near Sarapul is wide and deep, flowing among the yellow clay cliffs, splitting between the islands and carrying on its oily smooth, smooth surface the reflection of fir trees. As such, it is free and so calm. The silent destroyers do not disturb the captivating peace of the river. Hundreds of swans are dotted along its banks their white wings ventilated by the late October sun. A flurry of ducks creates a momentary shadow as it rushes to land on the water. Far above the white church on the shore, an eagle circles and soars. Even though the meadow, the meadow on the opposite shore is occupied by the enemy, not a single shot is heard from its low-lying ground cover. Obviously, we were not expected here and they haven't had time to prepare for our arrival. So that gives you, I think, a little flavour of just how evocative her writing is. And it's like that all the way through. You know, she's just brilliant, I think. Thanks for that, Jack. And um, is Judy back? No. No. I think she's gone. <laughs> So, oh, oh, I think, uh, are we done now? <laughs> Basically, it's coming up to 8 o'clock. Um, sorry about the technical difficulties. Well, it was great when the videos worked. So, yeah, so yeah, thanks excellent. to everyone that's watched. And the book is called The Hammer and the Anvil. You can buy it uh, from Bookmark's bookshop. You can buy it online from the shop. Or you can, you can phone them or email them, bookmarksbookshop.co.uk. Um, I should also acknowledge and it's been mentioned a bit but Kathy Porter's prize-winning translations of Reisner's The Front, Afghanistan and Coal Iron and Living People and Richard Chappell's of Berlin October 1923, Hamburg at the Barricades and In Hindenburg's Country are to be published shortly by Historical Materialism Books and with a new expanded edition of her Larissa Reisner A Life and so that's Kathy Porter's books to look out for. The next um, couple of events that we have at Bookmarks are on 19th of March, Kathy Porter herself is going to be introducing Colin Tai writings from the struggle. So another great um, woman revolutionary of this, of the Russian revolutionary era. And on 31st of March, we're very pleased to welcome Michael Rosen. And Michael Rosen is going to be talking about the Paris Commune, uh, which was 150 years ago, um, of course. So. Thanks um, everyone for joining and um, I hope to see you at the next event. Bye.